I'm going to brainwash me. This gallery is in itself a work of art. I'm surprised at how many people have a car. They won't let their wives drive it. I sort of realise there aren't any people of colour in those departments. Women in Australia retire with 35% less super than men. And we're sick of it. The system was never built for us, so Verve Super was. Verve was founded by women to support women to build wealth and invest in a better world, while we all work together for change. Because super is power, and women deserve more of both. Verve, proud partner of All About Women 2021. Where me? Well, I'm a Bemai. Juba Gali. Nora Gadigu Mujin. Gurgawiri Gagala Gui. Yaguna Bariala Anga Pujari Gunyalu Yanum. The Sydney Opera House acknowledges the lands of the Gadigal. And we welcome you to Juba Gali, now known as Benelong Point. The Sydney Opera House honours our First Nations by fostering a shared sense of belonging for all Australians. And we pay our deep respects to the Gadigal people, traditional custodians of Jubagali. Welcome to the Sydney Opera House and enjoy the show. One more time, a bit louder then. Ready? How are you feeling? You feeling good? Woo! Hello, everybody watching the stream at home too. My name's Yumi Steins. Are you ready to welcome our guest? I know she needs no introduction, but I'll give her one anyway. Catelyn Moran's 2011 feminist memoir, How to Be a Woman, covered masturbation, abusive relationships, and abortion. 10 years later, Catelyn is 45, and feminism is now sold at the supermarket. And the British columnist is turning her eye to the exasperations of middle age. Parenthood, Botox, saggy bits, the gendered and invisible labour that occurs behind the closed door of home in her book, More Than a Woman. Please welcome to the Sydney Opera House's All About Women Festival, Caitlin Moran! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Kylan, it's so good to talk to you. I wish you were here in person. I really wish I was there in person, but I like that it's high energy despite the distance. <laughs> so we're going through a bit of a moment here in Australia. Are we not, women? Are we not going through a little bit of a feminist moment right now? Um, where the country's highest lawmaker, the Attorney General Christian Porter, has been accused of rape. And I think that a lot of us are feeling angry, Catelyn. Are we yes. feeling angry? Yeah. yeah. 
We're, are we feeling really, really, really angry? So I'm so pleased to be talking to you tonight, Catelyn, because we want to know how can we weaponize this anger and turn it into something that is going to make actual change happen? The thing about moments like this is that it is a bit of a mixed grill because when you go through one of these big feminist anger moments, there is the physical feeling of, am I having to do this again? I'm being angry again. How many more times am I going to be angry? How many more times are women going to have to be angry? I am getting so tired. It is giving me acid indigestion. But at the same time, I have to remember that when, in, even in my teens, in like the 80s and 90s, we didn't have waves of feminist anger like this. Like kind of, we didn't have the language or the tools. And the big difference has been social media. We, this, is, this is the first time that women across the world have been able to talk to each other unmediated and be able to recognize these things and name them. If you think of the language that we have developed in the last 10 years alone, you know, we can talk about gaslighting, we can talk about coercive control, we can talk about body positivity, we can talk about the Me Too movement, we can talk about Time's Up. And these are all words that just normal, ordinary women across the world came up with and went online and shared and it suddenly gave us a vocabulary. You can't change things until you name them. Them. And before, we were so far behind on the important business of naming these things because women could not communicate. We could not talk to each other. Now we can. So along with my, I mean, I'm an incorrigible optimist. So along with my rage, I also feel incredible positivity because at, at least we can have this rage. We didn't even have this anger before. We didn't even have a way to use it. So it, it's, it's a mixed grill. But, but this is part of a process. And I love, I was talking to uh, some of the people at this event earlier and they were saying that apparently over there the coverage has been really split in the media about the way that these, all these events have been covered. And they were saying that it's uh, many female writers that are understanding of it and, and talking up and defending the women and many male writers who are kind of going, well, I don't know, like kind of, you know, can you trust a woman? <laughs> Again, that's enraging, but I like the fact that the names are out there now. Like, kind of, they are, you are putting your name on a list. Like, who do you believe? Whose side are you on? And previously before, we didn't have as many female writers to put the other side of it. And at least now we can see what we've always known it is, but now it's formal. It is a war. Like, kind of, you're either on one side or the other. You either get it or you don't. And we now have the names of who's on what side. And that's very useful information going forward as well. So <laughs> it's a process. It's enraging. But there are millions of people involved in this now in a way that even two decades before, there would have maybe only been thousands who could do something about this. Totally. And I think, like, when we, we hear a name like Brittany Higgins, we don't think rape victim or survivor who's tainted. We think somebody who's got a huge future ahead of her who's courageous and brave, whereas I think people were frightened about that label being attached to them in the past. Well, that's what's always incredible. Whenever I hear, and it usually is a man, not all men, but it is usually a man <laughs> that will put forth this argument that, that women might make up rape allegations. Like, kind of, like... You would have to be a man to say that because I can't think of a woman in the world who would wake up one morning and go, you know what, I've got three hours before brunch. I might make up a rape allegation because that would be a fun day out for me. Like kind of, and the consequences of it will continue to be hilarious and enjoyable. Like that's not... <laughs> <laughs> If you have gone through that, if you know someone who has gone through that, you know how long it takes you to even tell someone you know, because that's a difficult process. The idea of telling the world and making this public, you know, we know it's a fractional amount of women who will go public with these things. They are astonishing women, the ones that have the bravery to do that, because it's usually done knowing that what will happen after that will be, for a time, the worst experience of your life possibly usually worse than the attack, which is an extraordinary and awful thing to say, but that is the truth. And so any woman who's still knowing all of this then goes forward and, and talks out is showing such leadership and such courage. And, you know, every time a woman does this, I think we're making it fractionally easier for the next woman. And that's, that's the beauty and bravery of women who do this. They know that they're, you know, they're not doing it for themselves, they're doing it for the next woman who comes along. But again, it's, it's the difference between the way that men and, women, men and women see this. I was reading about the General Angus Campbell case and the, the, uh, the army cadets, uh, where he was uh, the, um, where she, she 
she, I guess you guys know the the case that's happened there. She was yeah. an army cadet, and she was raped, and uh, and she finally made a complaint about it years later. And and the General Angus Campbell made this comment that like that it was her fault basically that she that there are these rules, which is the four A's: alcohol alone, um, uh, attractive, and out after midnight. And if you're a woman and and you are breaking any of those rules, you're drinking alcohol, you're alone, you're attractive, or you're out after midnight, then that's your fault like kind of that's the, you will be raped and I was thinking about this because recently I had to drop my daughter at the airport at three o'clock in the morning uh, it was one of those cheap early morning flights and we drove her to the airport and from the drive to our house to the airport at three in the morning I didn't see a single woman out on the streets it was only men and I suddenly thought, what a weird thing this was. There were guys walking, you know, over to friends' houses. There were people just, like, listening to music. It was sort of in the summer. And I just thought, how odd that is that women know this. You know, we, we have a curfew. We hide at home. 52% of the population knows not to leave the house after a certain time. And I just started thinking about how, how innate that is in us, that we know that it's scary, it's dangerous. People believe that anything can happen to you if you put yourself out of the house after a certain time. And I started to have this idea of, like, OK, how could you show the other half of the population how weird this is for us? Like, kind of, how can we show society how bizarre this is? And I wanted to have one day of the year that was the opposite of the purge, where for one day of the year, men have to stay at home at night and women go out and reclaim the streets. And it's only women out at night. And you can go out and you can jog and you can walk your dog and you can walk to your friend's house and you can walk back from a club or a pub or a restaurant and you're not scared because it's all women and we're out there dancing and we reclaim those streets just one night of the year just for you to finally see the visuals of what it's like it's like oh my god there's all these women here where have they been we were at home and we were scared <laughs> this has to change Fantastic idea. We all love that. Um, I know Catelyn Moran is a lot of people's favourite author. If you'd like to present her with a question, we'd love to hear from you. Silo, Slido, sorry, slide.do. Um, look for that on your browser and then you have to use the event code All About Women. Select the venue that you're in. So which of the theatres that you're in today's theatre is the Joan Sutherland Theatre. And from there, you'll be directed to the question submission page. You can do that if you're watching from home on your device or within this room live. OK, so it is so good to talk to you because you are um, kind of celebrating this book more than a woman. I want to know, you know, how is one of our best loved feminists finding her 40s? Oh, it's hard on the knees. You really miss them when they go. <laughs> the main thing I have to say to every woman younger than me is just enjoy your knees while you can. <laughs> just kind of be really consciously aware that whenever you sit down at the moment in your younger years, you're not having to go, oof. But the, will, the day of oof will come. And as you sit down, you'll go, oof. And that's the start of middle age. <laughs> I love it. Now, I can't, I know you can't see the audience that well, but there are a lot of women here today. Thank you for coming along. I want to know about being a white feminist, how can you be a better ally to brown, black and indigenous women? You, this, this is a, this is a, uh, a, a complex issue. It's often presented as a complex issue. And I just think, for my part, it is you have to listen, you have to never presume that you are speaking for other people, and you have to use your platform uh, to, to, to spread other people's words and to platform their works. And it's not something that I was as aware of 10 or 20 years ago. We didn't have those conversations. And that's one of the other amazing things about social media. Like, kind of, you know, I grew up in a mainly white area with mainly white friends. And going into the media, it's a mainly white industry. And so that was the world that I lived in until I went online. And suddenly you have, uh, have this ability to connect with these people all over the world. And you have people asking you questions going, well, you know, what's on your bookshelf? What do you read? And suddenly you look at your bookshelf and go, oh, God, yeah, I don't, I just read the classic white writers. Like, kind of, I need to go out and find some other voices. You know, what TV shows do you watch? Like, kind of, oh, God, yeah, I'd sit here going, you know, I'm a good liberal. But, yeah, most of the stuff that I watch, mainly because most of the stuff back then was made by white people. But you just suddenly, you know, it's being asked that question. And sometimes it's uncomfortable. But just going, yeah, I, you know, if you want to be a good liberal person, you actually have to make sure, am I being a good liberal person? Am I doing the work? Have I got enough voices in my life? Am I questioning myself? So, yeah, so it, it's been a process and one that I've, I've really enjoyed. But, I, I, you know, I make a very conscious effort now 
that when I'm using my platform, particularly on Twitter, I've got a lot of followers, that I am making sure that I have that I can retweet and replatform as many voices as possible. And it's, you know, it, it, it makes your life more fascinating. You know, I think we often think that being sort of liberal and right on um, is kind of like a luxury or a duty. It's a joy. Like, you know, it will make your life bigger and better. The more people you have in it and the more ideas, the better it is. So it's not something to tick off in a kind of, I've been a good person way or I must do this. It's like, no, run into the joy, run into a bigger world. <laughs> I see how um, a lot of us have evolved, like you say, in the last 10 to 20 years. And sometimes we can look back and cringe a bit at how unwoke or foolish or closed-minded we were, but we haven't all published books full of our own opinions the way that you have, Catelyn. <laughs> are you okay with your body of work or do, are there some things where you're like, oh, God, I think I need to, like, rewrite that or rethink that opinion? Oh, God, I mean, did this happen? If you're not doing that all the way through your life, then you're doing something wrong. Like, kind of, the, I think we do tend to have this opinion that, you're born as you are and that's who you are and sometimes you know if you say that you're changing people are like oh well that's a fancy and weird thing like kind of you're supposed to stay as you are and it's not like kind of like if you're not changing all the time and learning and trying to be a better person you're doing it completely wrong um so yeah no I mean, it's just a constant learning but it's also it's also with all the whole britney spears documentary at the moment it's the the thing that it's often hardest to realise if you are constantly putting work out there. It's hard to remember what the climate was like at the time. And with all this talk around the Britney Spears documentary at the moment, it reminded me when I wrote How To Be A Woman in 2011, it was such a toxic atmosphere for women. I, I'd, you know, I, I was aware of it at the time, but it's with that distance that you kind of have perspective on how much things have changed. But it was like a killing field for women out there. Like I kind know of if anybody, women were being torn apart. The tone was constantly hectoring and negative and hateful to women across the board. And I remember when I wrote How To Be A Woman, my primary objective was to write something that was kind to women, that just put, that everything about women was just like, do this, do that, sort your minge out, buy this handbag, <laughs> get this money, do this sex, be much thinner, kind of, you know, be successful and popular. And I just wanted to write a book that put my arm around women and just went, God, this is stressful and weird. Like, yeah. kind of like, we are human beings. Like, kind of, I'm on your side, mate. Like, let's try and make things better. And, uh, and you, and you realise now as we sort of watch these documentaries about Britney Spears and talking about it then, so that's that big gasp moment. Like, wow, OK, that's the big change that's happened in the last 10 or 20 years. You know, we are we are kinder to women now. Women can support each other. We, we talk to and about women in a different tone mm. in the way that we did 10 or 20 years ago. Did you see, Catelyn, how um, Sarah Silverman apologised to Paris Hilton just in the last 24 hours? Yes, no, yes, yeah, I saw that, yeah. yeah. Oh, I don't know if you saw the Paris Hilton one. I saw the Britney Spears one where Britney had called her kids the most adorable mistake you'll ever see at the MTV Awards. And oh, she was really? like, I'm, I'm sorry. But I, again, I thought about that. But, you know, she was right to apologise. If you do something wrong, you should always apologise. But yeah. it's always worth remembering. It, the atmosphere then was so toxic. It was so anti-women and so it was a roast culture that... That, that women had to adopt that tone often to survive in that world. Mm. Like, there is internalised misogyny. In the, it, 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 not to excuse anything, but the contextualisation is always important. Totally. You know, you have to remember that you're part of a, of a wider climate. And, uh, and that's why it's so brilliant that that's changed, because I don't think any woman would make those jokes now. And that's done us all a favour. You know, you're not having to make those individual decisions on a joke. It's just like, no, never make those jokes. <laughs> that's saved us all a lot of time. <laughs> hey, one of the things that I really enjoyed from your book... Um, and it actually, I think, improved my relationship with my partner. Um, you said that women are unable to soar without a supportive partner, without a supportive partner, or to put it in your phrasing, do not marry a cunt. Because I wouldn't be sitting here if my husband were not supporting me and, uh, you know, and just being so cool with our kids. Um, can you elaborate on what you meant by that? Yeah, well, let's face the basic maths. As you said, you wouldn't be on that stage tonight if you did not have someone who was going at least 50-50 with the childcare. And I suspect you'd be in an empty auditorium because <laughs> presumably every woman who's there who has kids has also got someone who went, you know what, I'm a good guy. I'll have the kids tonight. You go and have some fun. And that's the simple, awful maths of it. Like, you... 
and and it's not something we talk about enough when you know when women are younger like the, the partner that you pick will dictate the future of your life and your career like you know it's a horrible fact don't marry your glass ceiling like the ability, if, if you want to have children, your ability to work will be absolutely predicated on how much of a not dick your partner is. <laughs> Even if you get one of a great guy, a great guy who does 48% of the childcare and housework. And like, you know, most women would be like, hey, you know, don't twist on 48%. That's good. That's better than a lot of guys. But that's still an extra 2% that you've got to do. An extra 2% of childcare, an extra 2% of, of, uh, of housework. And all that we have, in our lives is our time. That's all we've got. That that's that that is your life. It's your time. And every minute and hour that you have to spend pulling someone else's baggage, pulling someone else's weight, and pulling someone else's duty is a a waste of your life and b the eating away of your career. So do not marry your glass ceiling. Pick your partner well. <laughs> There's something that you said about um, male pride. You know when babies come. Oh, it's my male pride. I want to be able to take care of the family so they continue to work while the woman takes care of the babies. The day that I realised this, I just jumped up and down. I was so angry but so happy I'd finally worked out this sentence. <laughs> this is so often used as an excuse for so many male behaviours. Just kind of like, no, I've just got male pride. Like, it, I would not like it if I was not the main breadwinner. Like, looking after the kids, like, I've just got male pride. There's no such thing as male pride, Right? It's just, you don't want to be poor. <laughs> you know, you want money. You want to have the money. You don't want the woman to have the money. You don't want to look after kids. It's boring. Like, it's not pride. It's just either boredom or fear of being poor. We've got exactly the same thing. <laughs> but we don't call it female pride. We just call it, I want money, and I want someone else to look after my kids for 20 minutes <laughs> while I go and watch Game of Thrones. So true, so true. I don't want to be poor. I'm terrified of it. Okay, so there's in your book, there's a few things that you, um, a few notes that you hit a few times over. One is other people's bad marriages. You see yes. that you see them arguing. Um, sometimes it makes you and your husband horny because you're not in an unhappy relationship, which is great. But other times it's just super depressing to be around. Do you think that women need to be given a toolkit for leaving? Yes, and uh, and unfortunately, because we don't have that at the moment, it's still in society. And the way that we do it is, it's a friend repeatedly going up to them, going, "This isn't working for you, mate. You've got to go." And knowing that when you start that process of talking to your friend, that it's going to take years. It takes so long. And uh, one of the things that I've realised over the years watching so many uh, friends' relationships and, and marriages fail is that they don't leave when they're angry. Uh, they don't leave when they're in love with someone else. Uh, they don't leave uh, when they've, like, rationalised it all and gone through all the facts and figures. You finally leave a failing relationship when you're tired, when you just can't do this anymore. When you wake up that morning, you're like, I cannot do this anymore. So in all those years where women are being angry and you're having the drinks and she's going, yeah, fuck him, this is over, rah, 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 rah. I've learnt that that's not when they're going to leave him. It's the final of the day when they ring up at like seven in the morning and just in a completely different voice go, I'm so tired. I just can't do this anymore. And uh, so it's knowing that you're in for the long haul. You've got to wait for that day where they're just tired and they've been worn down. But yeah, it's a big thing. Like kind of like this is this is the the, the business of middle age. I realise the kind of the luxury, if you will, that you have when you're younger, is that most of the problems that you have are your problems. They're they're to do with you. They're to do with your identity. They're to do with your sexuality. They're to do with you working out who you are. Like you know, you're a hot mess, and like you've got to figure all this <laughs> stuff out. In your middle age, suddenly all your problems are other people's problems. Like, you, you know, it's your children and your teenage children and how they're dealing with stuff. It is your ageing parents that you are caring for. You're stuck between your children and your parents. It's your friends' failing marriages. And suddenly, being a middle-aged woman is you are the fifth emergency service. You are the one that is going around looking after everybody because care work, looking after people who are in trouble, is still seen as a woman's job. Mm. And we put no monetary value on it and it is absolutely presumed that middle-aged women will hold society together with their bare hands for absolutely no pay at all. And that is why we are so tired. <laughs> that is why the middle age is the year of tiredness. <laughs> and lu lucky we're so strong as well at the same time. Yes. So middle age... We have to be, yeah. According to you, it's like having a five-page to-do list that never, ever gets any shorter. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I said five on in the book just not to depress people. It's more than five pages. <laughs> I mean, every... Every woman in the audience, when I said five page to do this, was like, five? <laughs> what have you left off? Mine's ten. But this is part of, it, it's the kind of apogee of being a woman, because I remember being aware at a very young age that to be a woman at any age is to feel like you are a to-do list. I remember having a very conscious feeling when I was very young that I would have to do a lot of things on this to-do list before my proper life would start. Mm. I can remember being 18 thinking, OK, I will have to lose weight I will have to get the good hair. I would have to have the right job. I would have to get the capsule wardrobe. I would have to learn how to talk in a sophisticated way. I, you know, kind of there was all this list of things I felt I would have to do before I was finally properly me and my actual life would start. I just presumed this was some kind of weird warm-up rehearsal stage. And one of the big revelations is, you know, suddenly you get to middle age and you are still thinking that. You are still thinking my proper life will start at some point. This isn't it, is it? This Surely this isn't it. <laughs> And the one of the big moments in your life is going, no, this is it. Shit. And half of it's gone. Like, kind of, I need to wake up and start thinking, this is me. It's not going to change. It's had 45 years to change. I'm just going to have to crack on with what I've got. <laughs> <laughs> Try and enjoy this. It's so true. And so what's that about? Is it about self-acceptance? I think a lot of it is just to do with, I mean, I just, you, you cannot be what you cannot see. And, you know, although sort of representation of women is changing so rapidly, first in pop, because that's the fastest to change the diversity of women that we see, the different body shapes, just someone like Lizzo. Mm. You know, had I grown up in a world where as a teenage girl I could see Lizzo, a big woman coming out on stage in a leotard, being absolutely fabulous and radiating love, my life would have been completely different. But I didn't. I just had Kylie Minogue and Margaret Thatcher. That was all the women <laughs> were in my life. So... And trying to work out who you are between those two women, you know, <laughs> be difficult. Um, so, yeah, so it's it's about, so so you cannot be what you cannot see. So so when, if you don't see anyone like you on TV and or in films or in books and you don't see any stories like yours, then you just presume that at some point you'll have to turn into one of those people on TV. Mm. You know, every woman I know who was of a generation where you watched Sex in the City or grew up with the Spice Girls was like, which Spice Girl are you? Which girl in Sex in the City are you? never occurring to you that the reason you found it so difficult to kind of like, you know, properly answer that question is because you weren't any of them. There were other kinds of women. Like kind of, there's more than, there can be more than four or five kinds of women, like kind of, and it took me a long time to realise that. Like, yeah, no, I could be a bit of some of these and then something completely fucking different you've never seen before. Imagine that. Mind blown. I know, I'm still waiting to become not Asian so that I can get a job on TV. <laughs> um... Thank you. One of the things that you do, Catelyn, it just so partly drives me crazy, is you talk about how you love your fat tummy or your jowly neck or your bingo wings um, and that you can look in the mirror and just have complete and utter love for that, which, you know, I do love it, but it also drives me crazy because I don't know how easy that is for the rest of us to emulate. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things. There's no easy way. I, I found this out that, like, okay, the one of the big moments in your life, along with, you know, the first period that you have and, you know, your first child or whatever, is the day that you realise you have a voice in your head and that you are in control of it. That voice will have been made by many different people. It's your parents, you know, it's people at school, it's society, it's a bad boyfriend, it's a horrible boss. But the voice in your head that's going, oh, you fat bitch or you lazy bitch, or, you know, why don't you do something about this? That's, that's in your head, and you have to take control of it and change it. And I only realised that I had an incredibly negative voice in my head after I gave birth to my second daughter and had nearly died and just lay there looking at my legs in bed and for the first time went, I like good old legs. Hi, there you are. <laughs> like, you're good. Thank you for not falling off during that agonising birth. <laughs> then touching my belly and go, you're still there as well. Like, God, we really got out of this together. We're the gang. Like, thank you for that. <laughs> and just had 10 minutes. It was just 10 minutes. Just 10 minutes of just being grateful for my body. And just because I'd experienced it for the first time ever in my life at that point, I was like, oh, okay. So it can change. I could think so. It's not normal to be constantly hating your body. Because my absolute plan when I was 14 was to be involved in a car crash where I nearly died 
And the NHS would rebuild my body, but three stones smaller with a completely <laughs> flat stomach and no cellulite. Like that was that was my big. That was I can't tell you how much that was my big plan. Like that was that was the only way that my life could continue and be better. I would have to be rebuilt but thin after a massive car crash. Thankfully, that didn't happen, and I had to learn another way to get used to my body and then like it, which was to learn to control the voice in my head. So you have to start telling yourself to be kind to yourself, and it's the hardest thing in the world. You can't build that voice overnight from scratch being kind to you. So I would pretend that I had Oprah Winfrey in my head, and I was like, if I, you know, if at the end of a long day when I'm tired, my old voice would be like, yeah, but, you know, you've still got work to do, so just crack on with it, you lazy bitch. Whereas Oprah would go, girl, you have had a long day. You deserve to go to bed. You can watch some TV now. Well done, you. <laughs> and that was the modulation. That was the only female-friendly voice that I could think of. And so I just installed Oprah in my head and she started to teach me to just be kind to myself. Fantastic. But it's a life's work. You yeah. Know? There's no overnight fix. Yeah. You, you have a near-death experience during birth. And then for 10 minutes, you hear this voice and then you exercise that muscle. You flex your inner Oprah and you get better at hearing her. Yes. Yeah. Do it. Try it. Like, kind of like, just try having Oprah in your head for 10 minutes. See what happens. <laughs> now, you've said um, a few times already today, be what you, you can't be what you can't see. Um, uh, an idea that you return to is that a lot of what we do as women occurs inside the home, behind closed doors, where there are no witnesses. And importantly, it's private. It's sort of like in that private space where there aren't meant to be witnesses. And it's, it's in that space that it can be very maddening, it can be very lonely, and it can be very relentless without witnesses to our labour, to our sweat, to our love, to all of those things. So... What is the message of your book about that space? Is that, should we be giving up some of that territory? Should we be opening it up more? It needs to have light shone in it. So I, one of the reasons why I wrote this book was when I wrote How to Be a Woman, when I would do my live events, I would have signings afterwards and they would go on for four or five hours and I would meet hundreds thousands of women and young girls and at the beginning in the first couple of years after that book came out a very large majority of them were very troubled young women we would get you know women the girls who were scarred uh, you know girls with eating disorders girls who were big from overeating and so many would cry and we would talk and we would hug and we would you know it, it, th those were the girls and I wanted to meet them and then over time things changed and in the last couple of years when I've done my book tours, it's been older women, it's been middle-aged women who there's no crying, there's no kind of hugging and stuff. They stand in the queue and when they finally come up to meet me and I'm like, let's get a picture taken, give me a hug. They're like, oh no, don't take my picture. No, look, I'm too ugly. I'm too old and like kind of, or, oh no, I'm too fat. Hang on, I'm just going to pull my stomach in or God, I'm too tall. I'm a giant. Hang on, I'm going to crouch. <laughs> and I'll go, no, no, stop all of that. Let's get the picture taken. I love you. Tell me about your life. And they would go, no, I'm just really boring there's nothing to say really and I would keep talking to them and then it would turn out that they were you know that they were campaigning nurses who had changed healthcare in their area or they you know they had they had founded charities or or even the ones that hadn't done anything big you talk to them about their lives and it was a constant life of brilliance and service and care and I was like how can I make middle-aged women take up their space they were all trying to be so small and say nothing and be like, don't don't think about me, don't think about me. And that's because that's the space we give women and those jobs. You're not supposed to talk about the hours of care, the relentlessness of it, the actual day-to-day -day work that women do in the house. The domestic world is presumed to be boring and not to be discussed and you close your door and you just crack on with it and that's it. And there are no stories to tell and nothing interesting ever happened there and all the women who were doing it are quite dull bollocks to that like the stuff that is happening inside every house is as epic and life and death as any ring quest where the hobbits went to the mountain of mordor and threw the 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 ring in the crack of doom like women are day to day they are making love they are creating support systems they are saving lives they are forming young minds. Like, kind of, th this is the work of humanity. And the dramas that happen in a house every day and the decisions that women have to make and the speeches they have to give in order to, like, make a child want to live or to ease an old person into death 
You know, this is extraordinary work. This is huge drama. This is funny and sad and brilliant and massive. And I just wanted to, on behalf of all those women that I met in those queues, just open the door and shine a light into a house and go, stuff's happening here. Millions of women are doing this stuff and they are stars. This work is important and we need to start talking about it. Can I shine a light on your house? Um, because you talk about your daughter in the book and her eating disorder. Um, it sounds like one of the most harrowing and humbling experiences of your life. You're living a life as an active, vocal feminist, modelling body positivity, thinking that you're doing all the perfect things to build a girl and then this comes and completely disrupts your life. First of all, where are you on the other side of that, do you feel? Yes. So the first thing that I need to make very clear, thank God, is she is completely recovered now and has been for two years. And she was the one who wanted me to write about this. She was like, she was like, because she said, as she said quite rightly, her generation, when they talk about mental illness and eating disorders, mental illness, uh, eating disorder is a mental illness, they have no shame about this. They see no stigma about this. They see no guilt attached to it. If for them, mental illness is no different to physical illness. They will discuss it. It's our generation that was raised to think these things are shameful and to not have the vocabulary for it and or to believe that it's our fault um, or to believe that it's something that needs to be kept secret. Um, and we're the ones that have to help them. If anybody has had a child with, a, you know, a, a mental illness or an eating disorder, you know that whatever care you get and however difficult it is to access that care, still 99% of the day-to-day -day making of that child better is you. It's the family. That's Those are the carers. And if we aren't able to talk about this and if we don't know how to help ourselves, um, if we don't have the vocabulary to talk about it, if we're bringing all our baggage into the room, that kid's going to struggle so hard to get better. That kid may not get better. And when I wrote about this and we serialised it in the Times where I'm a columnist, it had the biggest response of anything I've ever written. I had thousands of people contacting me going, I have never been able to understand totally what an eating disorder is like until now. Like, I now know how I can talk to my children about this. I now know how I can help my ill child through this. And the thing I want to do most in my writing, I like to give comfort, I like to amuse people, but I like to be useful. And with this, with my daughter's, you know, insistence that I write about it, I was like, I can do some useful work here because there are things that we don't understand about eating disorders that it is genuinely a matter of life and death that we need to understand. Yeah. And for me, in my daughter's case, it was that, although I think I was, am, a really good parent. You know, I'm there, I'm attentive, I'm open, I'm, I'm very present. But the one thing I did not know how to do was sadness. Because I was brought up in a household where no one cared if you were sad. Like, kind of, you're sad? <laughs> There's a lot of people here, we're very busy, we don't care if you're sad. You would just plaster on a smile and crack on. And so when my daughter became sad, I did not want to face that. I used every other tactic to try and cheer her up and jolly her out of this profound mental illness. I would, she'd come through the door and I'd be like, and we're going to watch Pitch Perfect and I bought you a pet rat and like, <laughs> and look, I'm being funny, mummy, hurrah! Astonishingly, that did not cure that mental illness. <laughs> Then I would lecture her. We would sit down and give her TED Talks until two in the morning about why you have to eat and, like, you know, you, you, you know, your brain function and, you know, kind of your body and your bone density. That did not work. Then we were angry. It was like, well, why are you doing this? You know, come on, you can be stronger than this. You're an amazing kid. Get your way out of it. Obviously, none of that worked. The only thing that worked was when I finally went away, sorted my shit out, had a load of therapy and could finally sit down and do the thing that you must do with a child who has a mental illness. You have to say what you see, acknowledge what is in the room. We will do everything we can to not admit our children are sad because we think that's our personal failing. And that's what genuinely often kills them. You need to be able to sit down and go, you're sad. I can see that. I am not in denial of that. I am not scared of that. And I am going to sit with you until you are better. I am with you now. We will be able to talk about this unemotionally. There is no guilt attached. I love you. We're in this together. And to my shame, it took me two years to realise that that was what was needed. And that was the turning point for her. And obviously, knowing this now, I'm like, I need to tell everyone, <laughs> like, this is really big news. People will need to know this. If someone had told me, I would have given them a million pounds. Like, kind of, I need to tell everybody this thing that I have learned. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and please thank your daughter for sharing and, and allowing you to share. It's, it's, it's very meaningful to lots of people. Um, oh, well, she is, she, uh, she's so well cured now that it's like seven in the morning here. She's still up. <laughs> she's still partying with her sister Bye. in the garden. So once I leave here, I can go and find her drinking cider in the garden with her sister and go, hey, <laughs> Australia says thank you. And she'd be like, Ugh. Uh. Um, speaking of drinking cider in the kitchen, one of the things that you said, which which really I, I really wanted to ask you about, but maybe off air, about was about you you sort of getting allergic to alcohol in your middle age because so much of your <laughs> so much of your early writing is very boozy in that very English way. Are you completely sober now? No, God, no, not completely sober. Okay, but um, but no, no, but it's just. I, I was, it was just acknowledging this awful thing. And also, like, so much of the, the alcohol culture, I think, for women and particularly for sort of, like, my generation of feminists is it's such an easy token of freedom and oh, kind yeah. of fun and kind of I'm in control of my life. Like, you know, in the same with the cigarette. Like, it's just like, I'm a woman smoking a cigarette and drinking some alcohol. I don't care about the patriarchy and I'm having fun. <laughs> Hurrah! It's a brilliant shorthand and it's a fun night out. But, you, you know, you just ain't got the enzymes when you get to middle age. Like, I just... The hangovers would start to become apocalyptic. They would roll into day three and they would bring with them such towering fear and anxiety, like literally lying on the on the bed going, am I the devil? Is the devil in me? <laughs> have I killed someone last night? Why do I feel so bad? I would literally have to get my husband to go, you were simply a middle-aged woman who drank too much and sang a bit. You're not a murderer. <laughs> but I would wake up feeling like I might have murdered someone. The guilt was terrible. And apparently it's because as we get older, we do not have, women only though, men still have the enzymes, women do not have the digestive enzymes that allow us to break down alcohol in the way that we used to. So we just become intolerant of alcohol and all my middle-aged friends suffer from this same terrible problem. <laughs> we can't drink anymore. We'll just kind of like, we'll have like half a glass of wine and be like, oh no, I just can't take the pain tomorrow. I'm just going to have to stop there. Oh. It's such a sadness. <laughs> so no knees and no booze. That's what being 45 is like. A um, thing I loved was an article, I think you wrote it for The Guardian or The Times, about how um, menopause... Well, having children is like an addiction, like drug addict addiction, but menopause is basically coming off the drugs. Yes. So it's so from from my nineties youth, where I took huge amounts of ecstasy, I I noticed <laughs> that when you the next day have a come down on ecstasy, you can kind of feel the drug leaving your body. You become kind of heavy, and you become sad. And then you become very gr regretful of what you did the night before. Like, I was hugging strangers and telling them I loved them. Oh, no. <laughs> and I realised that as I go through the menopause and oestrogen leaves my body and I start to come down off oestrogen, that it feels exactly the same. I'm, I'm feeling sad. I'm, I'm wondering. I, it seems that, like, that the oestrogen made me really in, inhibited. Like, kind of, oestrogen is the love drug. Like ecstasy. Oestrogen is what makes you endlessly forgiving about your children rather than just turning around going, you are unreasonable. Even though you are a one-year-old, this screaming <laughs> at me is unreasonable. You are not a nice human being, are you? Let's face it. The oestrogen makes you love them anyway. The oestrogen makes you get married. The oestrogen makes you the mollifier in work situations. You know, kind of oestrogen is the drug that makes women nice and pliant. It's a love drug. We're on ecstasy. When you go through the menopause... All that lovingness and reasonableness goes away. So when you see women go through the menopause, they are finally not high anymore. They are straight. And that is why they get so angry. They're suddenly like, what is all this bullshit? Why is this person talking to me like this? Why is this job so shit? Why is the world so shit? I suddenly see what it's like. I'm so angry. I hate you all. That's what the menopause is. <laughs> Oh, I love it because I was like, I think I'm still high on that drug. I'm still loving and nurturing. I'm still trying to build bridges between enemies, doing all those nurturing female things. That will end, believe me. <laughs> there is a point where you feel like the last drop of oestrogen leaves your body and you're like, I have no more fucks to give. <laughs> yeah. Um, Caitlin, feminists make mistakes, and I think sometimes it's feminists who police the boundaries around gender. 
just like the worst misogynists do. Um, and I guess by that I mean, like, un unknowingly. Um, so my question is, is it time to allow and encourage men to be more flouncy? Oh, God, yes. I mean, the, I wrote so much about men and feminism in this book, because, like, for the last 10 years, being a feminist, whenever I do an event, people will, at the end of it, the very first question people usually ask is, but what about men? What about boys? Mm. And I'll be like, I'm just team tits. Like, my <laughs> speciality is women. I can't answer any questions about how to bring up boys or how to solve boys' problems. Like, I have specialised in this gender. I don't care about boys. It would be the ultimate irony of feminism if women had to solve all the problems of women and then clock on and solve all the problems of men as well. Like, they need to sort their own fucking shit out. That was very much my position for the first five years. <laughs> but as I've got older, I've started to realise that when we're talking, and we talk about feminism, when we, when we, you know, the definition of feminism being the, the belief in the, equal, the, the, the economic, social uh, and sexual equality between the sexes, Equality goes both ways. Like, what, what, would, what we're generally talking about when we talk about feminism is, is gender bullshit. Like, kind of, you're a woman, so you're supposed to do this, and this is how we treat you. You're a man, so this is what you're supposed to do, and this is how we treat you. And there is, you know, there is different but equal amounts of bullshit on both sides. As I found out when I went on Twitter about two years ago and said, look, I'm always here talking about the problems of women, but lovely men of Twitter tell me about your problems. And I thought we'd have an afternoon sort of tossing this around, but it went on for weeks. I got thousands of replies. It got picked up as a news story around the world. And the replies ranged from things that were ostensibly quite small, but kind of eventually blew my mind. Like, for instance, men don't get flowers. And the first guy who said that to me, I was like, well, you'll just have to learn to cope with that because I'm kind of dealing with like, unequal pay and rape. So you just deal with the flower <laughs> shit yourself. And... But as he started talking about it, I was like, yeah, this, that is weird because flowers are there out in nature and, like, only half of the people are supposed to enjoy them or give them to each other. Like, men, it sort of what opens out into a bigger thing. Men aren't supposed to like beautiful things. Beautiful things aren't for men. Men would go, you know, when my wife goes to bed, she'll blow out the scented candle because she just presumes I don't like a nice smell or she'll turn out the fairy lights in the front room and leave me in the dark because pretty things are for <laughs> girls and boys can't have pretty things. And one guy said he'd been... Well, I'd been retweeting all these answers. And he said, yeah, I, after I read these, I went and gave my 94-year-old father a bunch of flowers. And he burst into tears and went, that's the first time I've ever been given flowers. That's so lovely. So I started to think, OK, there's, you know, that's a little thing, but that's quite a big thing. Boys can't enjoy beautiful things. And then you go all the way through to huge things, like men going, if I'm in the playground and I see a child that is lost, I feel I can't go over and help that child because people are suspicious of men. Like, I would be seen as a threat. I have to go and find my wife or another woman and say, there's a child over there who's in trouble. Could you help it? And that's a profound thing for half the population to feel. That I suddenly realised there is such a thing as female privilege. Not a sentence we get to use that often, but one piece of female privilege I've always had is that I know people aren't scared of me and I can help people. And it's innate in human beings to want to help people. We want to help people, particularly scared children. But the half of the population that feel they can't do that, and then if you bring race into it, you know, if you're a brown or a black boy, and the, the added threat that you are seen to have there, that, you know, and, and from, a, from a small child, like, when does, when does it start? Like, as a child, you could go and help another child. You get to 12, 13, you start getting a bit taller, your voice breaks, and then you can't go and help other kids. And for, for half the population to feel like they're a threat that they're a weapon, that's a really profound wound, I think, for young boys to have and for men to carry with them. So I wanted to talk about, you know, a wider gender thing because the whole thing about the patriarchy is that it's bumming both genders, like kind of the these concept of gender roles are hurting women, but they are hurting men. And when, as you know, when you see a strident feminist going, men can't be feminists, like kind of this is a female only thing, I'm like, no, that, that the whole idea about equality is it's just all it is is an idea. So it's only as powerful as the amount of people who believe in it and can work towards it. And if you are automatically saying half the population can't be a feminist, feminism will will never be a global idea. That will never be accepted. It will never change the world. Mm. You, you can't hide all the great ideas in one place. You have to share them. If you really believe in feminism, you want everyone to be a feminist. So, um, So I wanted to write about how feminism now can you know the only 
Feminism is the greatest crowdsourced idea that humanity has ever had. And over the last hundred years, women have changed their lives in every single way because of this idea that all these women came up with and talked to each other and changed their lives. We can vote, we can go to, into space, we can smoke cigarettes, we can have sex. Men's lives have not changed at all in the last hundred years. They are absolutely the same and static. So when you start seeing the rise of men's rights activist groups, it's tapping into that that need, that that want. Boys going, our lives aren't changing and women's lives are. Well, the one thing that would change boys' lives in a good way is using this network that we call feminism to address their gender problems and finding them communities and them being able to solve their problems with gender in exactly the same way that we are continuing to do that now. So I just want us to start extending feminism to men as well and going, look, the women have invented this amazing thing, right? <laughs> and if you want to have a bang on it, it'd be good for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely idea. Um, lots of questions have come in and you can still submit one too from wherever you're watching today. Um, Slide.do, just go there. The event code is all about women and the theatre is the Joan Sutherland. Um, from Sasha, how do we teach kids about consent and also sexual pleasure? God, this is a big one. I was talking about this to a friend yesterday and I was saying that like, when I was growing up, the talk that parents would give their children was about what sex is. And now, unfortunately, and this goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, now, unfortunately, the talk that you have to give your teenage daughters is about rape. It's not about sex. It's about consent. And on the one hand, that's incredibly depressing because to explain to your children really early on that there are crimes that will be committed against them and they need to know about this is a depressing speech to give. But on the other hand, we should have been giving girls that talk through all of history because rape has been here for all of history. But it's only now that we need we know that we need to do this. And I think the key thing with, with sex and uh, and young people is the most important thing to get across. If you look at stats... It's in the 90% that I can't remember, it's the high 90s, I think 98% of all teenagers learn about sex and see sex for the first time from online pornography. And the most important information that we need to get out there as older women who've been around the block a few times is pornography is not sex. That is why there are two different words for it. When you're watching pornography, you're watching some people at work and you're watching a series of tropes and a business. That's not sex you need to go and find some sex. And there's an amazing organisation called uh, Make Love Not Porn that's run by this incredible campaigner called Cindy Gallup that she gets normal couples with all different bodies, different shapes, different races, different kinks, like whatever it is you're into, to film themselves in loving relationships having actual sex. And I wish that I could get the funding together to make that as free as something as you porn would be so that that was out there because... I, I'm writing a book at the moment where, for a variety of reasons, they're trying to make some adult male robots who know nothing about the world learn about sex for the first time. And the characters are going, well, what would be the quickest way to teach like these adult male robots who know nothing what sex is? And they're like, well, you show them pornography. That's how everybody learns about sex. And they're like, they think about it for 10 seconds. They're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, that is not the sex you would want them to know about. That, that's not good. <laughs> Don't show them that. No woman wants a man who's only learned about sex through pornography because joy is not in there. Female pleasure is not in there. And the amount, and the, the ratio of women who look scared to the amount of women that look happy in pornography is disturbingly out of whack. Mm. Um, so that's the key thing. Just very early on, you have to tell your kids, I know you've heard about pornography, I know you've probably already seen some, but you have to understand that's not sex. And if you're doing it like you've seen in porn, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Thank you. All I'm seeing, though, in my mind is um, scary, yucky male robots with raging hard-ons rampaging around. <laughs> and everyone... <laughs> And all the women go, ah, who let the robots loose? Uh, more questions um, from Jenny Brown. Which feminist women inspire you? Oh, my God. Um, I mean, I like my niche feminists. I like the ones that people haven't heard of. But, like, ultimately, it's the ones that get it out to the biggest platforms that are the ones that are changing things quickest. So the collaboration between Beyonce and Chimamanda and Gozi Adichie is 
my favourite moment of the last 10 years where Beyonce is reciting to Amanda's uh, uh, thing about what it is to be a woman. And at that point where feminism got that global platform, 10 years ago, that was absolutely unimaginable that two women of colour would be collaborating on something like that and that would be hitting an audience of millions, some of whom would be only having feminism and what being a woman is explained to them for the first time in those kind of terms. Yeah, that's such a huge piece of work that was done then. Like, kind of, you can't undo that. That genie is not end. That genie cannot go back in the bottle. Um, so, yeah, I mean, basically all the women, <laughs> there's not really anything I'd look at and go, you're doing feminism wrong. I think that's, that's usually where we go wrong when we look at women and go, you're doing feminism wrong. If you're doing any feminism, that's great. Like, kind of, it's feminism, there's no God of feminism, there's no Bible of feminism, mm. there are no laws of feminism. It is this crowdsourced thing that we've invented ad hoc as we go along, like a patchwork quilt. And everybody just tries to sew their little square and sew it to another one. You know, all the feminism doesn't ever get done in one day. Everybody's just doing a tiny bit and sewing it to the next tiny bit and making the quilt bigger and bigger and making us all warmer and warmer. How far, a question from Anonymous, have we really gone? How far have we really gone when you see the treatment of Meghan Markle? Oh, I, I, I... It's really split um, the ages in my country. I'm very pro-Megan. And, but I noticed that women sort of like 10 years older than me see her as a kind of whiny American who has too many emotions. And it reminds me of a thing that you see time and time again within women, because like talking about what happens sort of within feminism with women, there seems to be a belief in older women that if they manage to deal with all this shit, when, and you see it time and time again, like, yeah, I was sexually harassed, but I dealt with it and I carried on. Like, yeah, I was overlooked for promotion, but I stayed tough and I battled my way to the top. So if I managed it, then these other bitches should be able to manage it. And when these successful women say these things, they always forget that you can't see who had to drop out. Mm. Like, they will have had loads of contemporaries who couldn't deal with the sexual assault, who couldn't deal with the constant harassment, who couldn't deal with the constant being overlooked, and they just left the arena. And I feel that now when we're seeing people, when people discuss Meghan Markle, there's this kind of like, well, you know, look at the history of the royal family. You know, look at the Queen. You just have to slap on a brave smile and just carry on and kind of, and, you know, and just stop whining. Yes, it is hard being royal, but you're just supposed to handle it. Well, A, why? Like, just because something's been shit forever doesn't mean it should continue being shit forever. I'm sorry to be really basic, but that's, you know, that's a fact of life. And secondly, she's married to a boy whose mum died because of this. Like, there's a very strong correlation between being a woman who marries into this family, who is in the centre of media attention, your life going very bad, and then you possibly dying. So I understand why they're scared. I understand why they wanted to run away. Um, you know, I understand why they were to earn money, because people feel money makes you safe. And how are they earning their money? They're not earning it by burning down a rainforest, you know, or trafficking children. They're making liberal documentaries for Netflix. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> It's like, I find it hard to work out how people are being this angry about someone who's just trying to, like, you know, eat avocados and make documentaries about feminism. Like, let it get on with it. <laughs> um, what message would you give my nine-year-old daughter about the world she's in today and what's coming for her in the future? Oh, that's... Grrr, that's tough. Um, first of all, the, 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 the biggest... The biggest asset she has is she's got a mum who's asking that question and you just need to, and I'm, it sounds like you are, but there's this, I realise now that the most busy work that you ever do as a parent is in the lead up to adolescence. You need to make sure that the tap roots of this tree that you are growing are so deep before they launch off into their adolescence and that you are talking to them and that they feel they can come to you with anything. Like kind of, if you're thinking, yeah, I wouldn't start talking about her to her about, I don't know, sex or drugs or bullying or kind of the thigh gap or kind of, you know, dieting or stuff until she's a bit older because I don't want to introduce those ideas mm. to her. I'll wait until she's older. She's hearing about those ideas. She's already seen them and she needs to be able to talk to you about it. And she will pick up on the fact that you're thinking that's something we'll talk about when we're older and that's where these bad things grow in the silence where girls know that their mums think I don't I shouldn't talk about that yet or we'll leave it till later there's never it's never too early to talk about any of these things talk to your girls about everything because if you think they have don't know about it yet they do yeah. like you know remember remember the things we knew when we were young we forget kids are sponges they pick up on all these inferences mm. so yeah i i, I wish i when, when my nine-year-old daughter asked me what's a thigh gap 
I wish I hadn't just said a silly thing that you don't need to think about right now. I wish I'd t- sat down and talked to her and said, it's a virtually impossible thing that will make your life miserable. It's driven by this idea of unrealistic images. In order to be able to achieve it, you would not be having to eat. It's not something you want. Here's a picture of Lizzo. Let's go and find some <laughs> body positivity Instagram accounts. Uh, bombard them be in their faces give them all the feminism you've got (laughs) yeah i love it i love it um you've spoken of women's third angry act post menopause many men won't come with us or want that particular woman says anonymous do i marry my dildo next (laughs) and if you do put that wedding on instagram you will make a million (laughs) Women across the world, I'm imagining a dildo in a little top hat. <laughs> you would do the vows. Maybe a couple of the little clitoral stimulators, the smaller ones as bridesmaids behind you. Like, this is money, bitch. Like, who is not going to want to watch this? <laughs> I, I realised when I... Because when I first started my menopause and the anger started, I didn't know it was the menopause. I just thought it was Brexit. I just knew I was very tetchy. <laughs> and then I realised it was hormones. And... I am luckily married to a very lovely man. And I realised that, like, I was I was thinking about this recently. I went around to an exhibition of religious books at the British Library. So it's the history of uh, every religious sort of foundation myth in the world. And the, the Ten Commandments, you know, they're, they vary in number. But the sort of the key commandments seem to be the same in every religion. It's like, thou shalt not kill. You must not covet your neighbour's ass. Uh, you know, it was all this stuff. And I was just thinking... Who are these commandments for? Because you don't need to tell women not to kill because we don't. Look at the stats. Like, we get killed. Like, kind of, it's not, you wouldn't, it's not so common in women you'd need to make it a key rule. And similarly, um, when it's, you know, you shall not be prideful. You don't need to tell women not to be prideful. We are constantly denigrating ourselves and putting ourselves down. So I was thinking about what the Ten Commandments for women are because we have completely different sins. And I think our number one sin is martyrdom. We we love to just take on too much and huff around the house being like, ah, well, I guess I'll do everything yet again like a hero. And that's a sin. We need to not do that. You know, we need to actually, if we're with people who love us and reasonable people, they will listen to us when we say, I'm going insane, I'm doing too much. So I finally conquered my sin of martyrdom by getting a massive whiteboard and putting it in the kitchen and writing, this is mummy's to-do list. These are all the things in my head making me angry, listing all the jobs that needed doing in the house, and then wrote at the bottom, everyone needs to take three of these a week and do them by Friday. And it took about a week to get the system up and running. There was a bit of resistance, had to do a bit of shouting. But now I share my to-do list with the family. And it is a genuinely revelatory experience. I am not consumed with fury and anger and martyrdom anymore. And I I, I pray you all get a whiteboard and do this. (laughs) It is life-changing. Is one of the tasks on it pick up the dog's poo? See, the thing is, I like that. (laughs) It's quite cold here still. And whenever you're picking up a dog's poo in a plastic bag, it's like a little nature's hand warmer. So I like it. You just keep it in your pocket for later. Um, Kim just wants to say thank you for sharing um, your personal reactions to your daughter's situation. She said that helps us on our own interactions and conversations and it's not part of the blame game, so thank you so much. Um, One last question from Anonymous. Why do women consistently question my choice to be a single woman with no kids and try to make me feel like I'm missing out? I'm free of all these burdens, she says. It's... I, I, the chapter that I wrote, um, uh, Why You Shouldn't Have Children in How to Be a Woman, was because my sister had, from the age of 10, gone, I won't want to have children. And the pushback she got from the age of 10 when she said this mm. horrified me and lived with me throughout my life. That we, we are still a, a generation or two away, I think, from not thinking that the natural story of every woman has to be that you will meet someone and you will have some children. Like, kind of, that you're not a proper woman unless you do this, that you can't fully understand the world. Now, don't get me wrong, being a mother is hard and you to boot camp and you learn a lot of shit really fucking fast. But there's nothing that you can't learn from being a mother that you can't learn by travelling and loving and drinking whiskey and writing poetry and reading books and climbing up a mountain and jumping in a lake. Like, kind of, this is... There are other ways 
to be a brilliant woman than reproducing. You know, it's it, the, we have a multitude of ways to do these things. And I think that we'll know that we have reached the next stage of feminism when we stop automatically asking women, when are you going to have children? When are you going to have children? When are you going to fit this into your life? When are you going to have children? Because whenever I hear people saying that to women, I'm always hearing them saying, when are you going to have children and fuck off? Like, when are you going to have children and you will be so busy with your kids that you will leave this arena and you will not be able to work as much as you do and you will not be as vocal as you are and you will not be as public as you are and you will have to be removed for 20 years and you will leave the arena just for men. It feels like a way of saying to women, you're not enough and you need to go away and it needs to stop. It's a really good way of framing it. And um, on that note... I just want to invite our audience who's live here tonight. I know there's a lot and a lot of people watching on their devices elsewhere that aren't in this theatre. But one of the things that Catelyn really wants to encourage is people to use their voices, to women especially, take up space. So could I invite you to stand up, please, everybody who's here? And using your voices and your hands, could you please thank Catelyn Moran for an amazing night? Thank you so much. I can't believe I just flashed my sports bra at Sydney Opera House, but it was the only reaction I could think of. Yumi, thank you so much. You are a goddess. Oh, thank you. I thank hope you. I get to meet you in person soon. Me too. Thanks, Kellen. See you later. Thank you, everybody. Thanks all about Women Festival. Thank you.